Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. So today's podcast interview is with Charlie from Covey Rise Farm. Now, Covey Rise Farm is a pastured meat-based farm outside of Columbus, Ohio, so right a couple hours from me. And um, I can't actually go wait to hang out with Charlie and his wife, Carissa. And they actually just got married this year, so congrats on that, you too. But they've been farming around five years, and Charlie's background is not agriculture, so he grew up in suburban. And then um, in the episode, we talked through his journey of discovering um, the omnivore's dilemma and, uh, you know, books on food and how he got started farming. They started on rented land, 13 acres. Just this uh, last year, they were able to purchase 75 acres that they are on now. And the last year has been a slog in getting the farm um, built out, the infrastructure, the fencing, the pasture. This year has been horrible in, in Ohio and weather. So we talked through that aspect as as well on the the podcast. Um a couple of key points I want to pull out though is that sales is so important. So Charlie talks about how getting a system for their sales and their farmers markets has been key. Um, the chef sales is a significant portion of their sales as well and he talks about the how they locked those in early and how now restaurants are actually coming to them for product, which is very encouraging as well. Uh, he talks to the startup phase, you know, we actually dive into details of what their favorite fence charger is and uh, and that kind of thing. They are large-scale poultry, so they do about 15,000 broilers a year. So he talks about the mobile range coops and exactly where they got those from, the importance of hiring good help, and the exact type of people that they like to hire. So that was really good. So again, guys, uh, you may be a vegetable farmer, you may be a grain farmer, but every single one of these episodes usually talks with the same principles about marketing and business and hiring help and all of that. And the other thing I think that's important is that Charlie, is this is his first year of being on the farm full time. So before that, it was part time. And with a lot of startup farms, I know so many people struggle those first couple of years with the splitting the responsibilities between an off farm job or just farming seasonally and working in the wintertime. But as Charlie will tell you, you know, every single year, the balance sheet looked a little bit and a little bit better. And so that was really key to being able to go forward and know that they were they had a path forward in their farm. That you know, it wasn't just every single year. There just didn't seem to be no money at the end of the checkbook at the end of the month, but it was because they were pushing forward with capital improvements and investments in the farm, which were making that long-term farm profitability possible. So again, this is a great episode. You're going to really enjoy it. Charlie actually reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and said, Hey, you know, I know you say Ohio's not a hotbed of local food, but we're doing quite well and love to talk about that. So we brought him on, want to know more about what he's doing and the local scene in Columbus. So can't wait to go over there and hang out with him now and his wife and eat at some of the restaurants he did, he's talked about. And before we jump into the actual interview, I wanted to share a review by Stargirl12864, which I'm hoping that's your zip code because if it is, that was quite close to where we had our farm in New York. I believe that's a Salem, New York zip. So um, she says, always a helpful, efficient, and simple approach to hard topics. Thanks for your approach to a whole range of topics. Even the flower gr grower in me enjoys the non-floral episodes. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, Stargirl12864. Appreciate your feedback. And guys, please, please, please leave us reviews. We have 89 five-star reviews, and we do have two one-star reviews. Well, you just you can't win them all, um, but we do appreciate you guys leaving reviews, and it's super easy. Just go to thrivingfarmerpodcast.com, and there's a link right on the homepage that will take you right to the review page. So you, It's really super easy for you to do that. So join me in welcoming Charlie to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Charlie. Thanks for having me, Michael. So, Charlie, can you tell us a little bit more about your farm? So, we're a 75-acre pasture-based farm here in central Ohio. Uh, we're located about 45 minutes northwest of Columbus, Ohio, in northwest Delaware County. Um, we're a pasture-based operation. We raise uh, poultry, sheep, and pork, uh, lamb, or pigs, 
pasture poultry is kind of our biggest specialty. Got into that initially, and then everything else has kind of been offshoots of that. Currently, we're raising about 15,000 broilers a year that we direct market all of. Um, So that's definitely the centerpiece of our operation. Very cool. So the broilers, that's a lot of broilers. Are they all going locally to you guys, or do you ship it all? So we are about probably at this point 80 to 90% local. Um, We just started a shipping program about eight weeks ago uh, in the end of August. Okay. Um, But uh, most of it's going local. Um, We've got several different avenues that we're selling. Um, It started off a lot of restaurant sales, um, and that was probably, it was probably an 80 to 20 split wholesale to retail Mm -hmm. uh, when we started five years ago. Um, And then ever since then, it keeps getting closer and closer to 50% retail, 50% wholesale which is really where we want it to be. Um, we've just kept raising, uh, raising more birds uh, and increasing the retail side while kind of keeping the, the wholesale side the same and adding a couple chefs each year, it seems. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Now, you guys aren't a certified organic operation. No, sir. Nope. We, um, with livestock, we kind of had some, some mixed feelings on that. Mm-hmm. Um, that mm-hmm. and just the, especially cost of feed. You know, we, went, we started off uh, when we started this, mission um we looked at non-gmo conventional and organic uh and to go from conventional to non-gmo almost doubled our feed costs and then to go from organic uh, non-gmo to organic would have doubled our feed costs yet again um and we just did not see the the market demand there for the birds that we really wanted the number of that we wanted to raise to mm-hmm. be economical at scale um we just didn't did not see enough demand there to to go organic Gotcha. No, that totally makes sense. So you're in 75 acres and talk to us a little bit about the farm. Is that all, um, it's, it's all pasture and do you guys have like wells for water or are you pumping from ponds? How's that set up? Yep. So we actually, and it's, it's kind of been a cool journey. Um, we started off on 13 acres and about a thousand birds a year, just five years ago. Uh, and over the pa- past uh, 16 months, we had the opportunity to expand uh, by the 75 acres that we're on now. But when we started really a year ago, almost to the day, this was just bare soil. Wow. Um, there was absolutely nothing here on this farm. So we've had, uh, which, you know, it's, it's got some definite pros and cons there. Um, we, we learned on an old dairy farm and old infrastructure that, you know, we definitely saw its pitfalls, but it was paid for. Mm-hmm. Um, now we have the opportunity to build everything out from scratch, but obviously a lot more money. Um, uh-huh. but we are able to at least build it out to how we want. So we've, uh, we've utilized, utilized the equip program, worked with NRCS quite a bit, some of the beginning uh-huh. farmer, uh, farmer programs. Um, so we've really added all the infrastructure from scratch. You know, we put in all of our building pads, all of our driveways, gravel, fencing. Uh-huh. Uh, we are on a well system. Um, we're actually just finishing up putting in 5,000 feet of underground water line wow. to, uh, to provide pasture irrigation to every corner of the farm. Um, then to, to your original question, uh, we're pretty much a hundred percent grass. We do have probably a five or six acre kind of scrub woody early successional area that, uh, that we do our pastured hogs in, um, mm-hmm. a lot of our finisher pigs. And then we do have 14 acres, uh, that's enrolled in the CREP program right now that comes out next year. So it's a warm season grass bottom, um, that we'll be converting into putting planting a lot of mass producing trees, fencing that next year. And then uh, hopefully in five or 10 years, starting to run pastured hog rotation under those mass producing trees in the fall. Okay, interesting. So that, that land was already in that program when you bought the land. So you had to let it stay in that program, correct? Correct. Yep. It was because um, we, we bought a subdivided farm. We had somebody that had 150 acres and they wanted to sell part of it off. Um, and it was already enrolled in it. Corrupt is a 15-year contract. Um, and we were, we bought it, I believe in year 12 of it. Um, so we were, we're about to start or we just started October 1st, the final year of that contract. Um, and we can start making some improvements to it right before the contract ends next year and, and start updating conservation plans and, and rolling it into eventually warm season pasture. Very cool. Now with the mass producing trees, what are you looking for? Are you doing hazelnuts, acorns, um, fruit? A little bit of all of the above. It is, since it was in CREP, it is kind of the bottom of the farm. So it uh-huh. is a little bit wetter soils. Um, 
we're looking at a couple different things and, and we're going to be working with NRCS on, on that as well. You know, there, we're going to have some acorns and oaks, um, but we're also looking at pretend, potentially kind of everything under the sun, everything from Chickasaw plum, American plum, uh, maybe some persimmon. Uh, I'm from the South originally. So I'm really looking at, there's a couple hybrids uh, of chestnut that are starting to come out that are, are mostly American chestnut hybrids. Um, mm-hmm. They're showing some resistance to blight. So we're, we're going to try planting some of those. Uh, it's going to be a mix of stuff that, you know, looking long-term into the future, but also wanting to see some stuff that actually produces a crop in our lifetime as well. Very cool. Very cool. So what was your background before you started farming? Uh, so it's kind of funny. I was actually a kid from the suburbs, um, grew up, uh, in Columbia, Missouri and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, well, my dad's a veterinarian. My mom's a nurse. I'm actually four generations removed from agriculture. Uh, went to Virginia Tech and studied natural resources conservation with uh, intentions of being a wildlife biologist, uh, but also had always had a strong love of agriculture and got a minor in ag economics as well. Um, spent the first six year, six to seven years after graduation working in the conservation field. Um, I worked for a nonprofit doing fundraising uh, and started the farm kind of four or five years ago, mostly just with the intention of raising food for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just kept kind of growing and growing and growing to the point it is now. And then, uh, this spring, um, I went full time onto the farm. My wife still has an off farm, off farm job. Um, but my, my background was really in conservation biology and and honestly just growing grass is, is kind of what I did for a career. Interesting. Well, you're a pasture based farm, so it kind of fits. (laughs) Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It made, it kind of all came full circle. Yeah, very cool. So let's talk about uh, the day on your farm. How does that that work for you? I mean, animals are early risers. Are you out in the field at first light or? Yeah, we try to be up and it's kind of all depends on the season. Um, Summertime, we kind of joke that raising pastured broilers is a lot like being a dairy farmer. It's twice a day every day, whether you Uh like it or not. Um, And we do, you know, we're Every day is different. Every every day seems to be a new adventure, especially building building the farm from scratch. But we try to get up. Uh, we do have some seasonal help in the summertime that helps us, and we're usually we try to get going by seven o'clock in the morning, if not a little earlier, um, depending on what the weather's doing. Get chores knocked out. Um, you know, if something's broken or needs fixed from overnight, you know, tackle that. And then this year's been obviously a lot of infrastructure projects, so it's been just right into tackling that. Uh, we do process broilers every other week in the summer. Okay. Um, we're utilizing all USDA processing for both our red meats and our, our white meats. So unfortunately our closest processes are both two hours away. So processing weeks are typically Monday night after dark loading out birds, uh, Mm -hmm. for delivery first thing Tuesday morning. Um, Tuesday afternoons is loading out pork and or lamb for Wednesday first thing delivery and then picking everything up and making deliveries on Fridays. Uh, and then obviously day-to-day farm management and chores in between those. Okay. Very interesting. So every other week on the, the fresh birds, now are you freezing some of those so people can buy every week from you? Correct. Yep. We make deliveries every single Friday. Um, and keep, uh, we're both utilizing off farm commercial storage as well as on farm storage. Uh, mm-hmm. So we, we keep a stockpile of product to get us kind of a one to two week cushion on farm and between our, our storage. Um, this year we really expanded and, and overproduced. So we've got, you know, right now, right at the end of the growing season, we've got about 11 pallets of, of chicken frozen in commercial cold storage that mm-hmm. then we'll keep pulling from throughout the winter. Uh, and amazingly, we had a, a little bit of pushback from chefs early on, um, wanting fresh product every single week. Mm-hmm. Uh, but honestly, they cannot tell a difference between the fresh frozen and the fresh products, uh, which is, is really good for us because it allows us to not have to process every week when we've got so much uh, driving involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when we were at Polyface, we processed twice a week. And so that was obviously a big reason they had us there as interns, but it was also, you know, a lot of processing. So I can see why that's really attractive to be able to do it every other week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it still creates its own fair share. Trust me. There's times I wish we were once a month or once every six weeks with it. Uh, Mm -hmm. But it definitely, it creates nice supply channels and the, the every other week seems to work pretty good with our infrastructure with birds coming in, birds going out. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it does create some really, really tight turns. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, on processing weeks when we've got chicks coming in, birds going out, birds moving from brooders to outdoor pens, it's it's really a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it comes together pretty nicely. Now, obviously, are you losing all the offal and feathers? Uh, so, no, we do keep back um, both on our white meats and our red meats, uh, feet, livers, gizzards, hearts. Okay. Okay. So you do bring that back, but let's say the waste product, you're not bringing back to capture that nutrient. Nope. Yeah. Unfortunately, all that stain, um, and then they've got a commercial renderer that mm-hmm. does it. And I mean, honestly, yeah, it'd be nice to, to capture that and use it into our composting system, but it'd be such, it'd be so many pounds of material that it just, it wouldn't be worth handling. You know, we had, yeah. we had used spent brewer's grains early on that were even a lot closer than our, our, uh, our broiler plant and even that just became such a time suck that it wasn't worth the amount of work that we were having to put into it even for those materials gotcha yeah and because you're a pasture-based farm you know all the feed you're importing is a um yeah a nutrient anyway yep and we and we do you know between our just like uh l uh, j and l farms jordan green mm-hmm. uh, we actually copied his brooder design so you know we've got wood chips coming out of brooders every other week that we deep compost um our two barns over the winter time is uh, a straw deep bedding manure pack that we clean out a couple times a winter and, and compost that so compostable material we've not uh we've not had a lack of so far gotcha that's good so let's talk a little bit about the the management now of the farm. What systems have you set up to ensure that you focus and tackle on the most vital priorities each day? I'd say that's probably something that, especially with growing so fast, we've still kind of struggled with. Um, mm-hmm. The biggest thing that we've we've really implemented this summer is uh, my wife and I use Wonderlist on our phones mm-hmm. um, and kind of sit down, especially over the weekend or on Mondays, and just figure out a game plan. Um, she's doing more and more of the marketing stuff. I'm trying to focus more and more on the production side of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we just kind of set up a game plan of, Hey, here's the big task, you know, the 30,000 foot level stuff that we got to work on. And then here's going to be the day to day things. And unfortunately with livestock, it seems like every single week you come up with a plan and by Wednesday you might've gotten to part of the plan. Uh, Mm -hmm. there's, there's always, especially raising sheep, there's always something that is going to go a little haywire. Mm Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So what do you feel like daily habits for you contribute to success? Are you an early riser? Do you like to get up and think about things early or um, do you like to take some time during the day to just uh, think about set up or? I definitely, I, I'm the type that I definitely need a cup of coffee in the morning before my brain's fully churning. Um, okay. So try to, try to get up before our, our help gets here, get a cup of coffee in me, start thinking about the day. Um, and then honestly, the biggest thing that's helped is just, you know, just staying focused um, mm-hmm. not letting the day-to-day grind wear you down, uh, especially early in the season is a lot easier than later in the season. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's just staying focused, just trying to tackle one thing at a time, not just running around trying to put out all the fires, just, you know, focus on one thing, do it really, really well, and mm-hmm. then move on to the next thing. So you're not constantly having to backtrack and redo things. Mm-hmm. I see that as a huge problem is they just, they half fix 16 different things. And then next week, 16 things break again. Exactly. And I mean, we were, I think everybody's guilty of it, especially earlier in their careers. Um, you know, every farm and we're at the same point right now where you really need three or four people, but you can only afford one. And you know, that's just the way it is, but mm-hmm. we've definitely learned that it's, it's much better to fix something right from the get go than, than, you know, fix it halfway and then have to come back in a week or the next day and just redo and spend the exact same time on the exact same problem. There's mm-hmm. really, we, we, you know, we've done it, everybody's done it, but it definitely, the sooner you can break yourself of that habit and just take the extra half an hour, hour, just fix it right. Um, and then you're not having to go back and, and redo the work because there's nothing more frustrating than redoing than fixing the same problem day after day after day. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what would you say the hardest thing you've ever done as a farmer? That's, um, I'd say this year's probably been the a culmination of the hardest. Uh, we, mm-hmm. you know, expansion and, and grow into the point that we have, you know, we almost doubled, if not tripled our broiler production over the last 18 months. Wow. Um, and from an, along with building a farm from scratch on one of the wettest years on record. Um, mm-hmm. And just, men, I'd say mentally and physically, this has been the hardest just culmination of a year. It's not been one single thing 
that's been hard has been the the overall you know just challenge of that project in and of itself and staying motivated every single day and waking up and, and getting after it every single day is is definitely you know mentally and physically taking its toll mm-hmm. um yeah. there's not really one single event that i can point at um but you know we're we can see the light at the end of the tunnel now and it's it's pretty amazing my wife and i were just looking at each other the other day and we were saying man, how nice is it here? We're at the end of the growing season for broilers and how nice is it next year just to be able to fill propane tanks, turn on things, make sure everything works and, you mm-hmm. know, not have to build everything from scratch on top of the day to day. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're pretty excited to, to be to that point. And I think this year was one of those, will the mud ever end? Oh it, yeah. I mean, by about the third time that we, we upgraded to the mobile range coops over the spring and we were building mm-hmm. those and, you know, they're phenomenal. I, I cannot recommend them highly enough. You know, the price tag on them was definitely a little painful, but when we look at a labor savings and, you know, just how much better it is to do our broilers, they, they were worth every penny. Mm-hmm. But about the third time that we had to put chicken crates down across the entire floor of them, even though we're high flat ground, because literally birds were drowning mm-hmm. in pastures. It's mm-hmm. just, <laughs> yeah. it was definitely, it, it was a spring for the record book. Yeah. Now, where are you getting those range coops from? Uh, those came from, it's the same ones that Cobb Creek down in Texas designed, and they came from a company out of Minnesota, I believe, called Polytech. Okay. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And they're the same ones that Pasture Bird and Cobb Creek uh, are using, um, and we, we bought them from the same company that Cobb Creek worked with. Yeah. Yeah. I was down there when Grady Phelan was running their operation and uh, incredibly impressed with uh, how just how well of a setup and how easy it was to take care of birds. Oh yeah. They are once, you know, I would say they were a bear to build and, and the check was definitely a little hard to write, but once mm-hmm. we've got them and now that we've got them established, they are, I don't think I could ever go back to any other system. You know, mm-hmm. if you're, if you're at any scale of birds, it's, it's worth every penny. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So uh, who are your mentors through this last five year journey of starting your farm? So, I mean, I would have to, you know, I, a buddy of mine, when I, before I ever started going down this path and had, had first moved into the area, had given me uh, the omnivores dilemma, you know, a mm-hmm. lot, the same book that a lot of people got into, into following this. And I read, you know, I had never, at this point, I was 23 years old, 24 years old. And I never, ever, never had heard of Joel Salatin, um, mm-hmm. didn't know anything about this movement, did not know anything about any of this even though I'd gone to college for, for biology. And like I said, I went to Virginia tech. So ironically, I was only a couple hours away from polyface at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did not know anything about any of these internships and had always been told, you know, I'd never be able to farm, mm-hmm. but he gave me that book and kind of read it and thought to myself, man, I could do that. So then I pretty much bought every single book that Joel had bought and, you know, read all those and, and started going down that rabbit hole and, you know, definitely aspired to do a lot of the things like Polyface had done and then started reading some of uh, Garish's work and Alan Nation. And, you know, you just start reading more and more and more. And as a biologist, it, it just clicked and it made sense. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'd say, you know, I've following on social media, Jordan Green, uh, Greg Gunthorpe, you know, everything mm-hmm. they're doing out at Pasture Bird, um, yep. Greg Judy, read a bunch of his stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different people that, and you kind of try to take everything with a grain of salt um, mm-hmm. and kind of, you know, dabble from, take ideas from a lot of different people and see what works for you. Probably looking back, uh, probably the biggest thing I'd have to say, kind of looking back at after, you know, in hindsight's 2020, after reading Joel's stuff is, it probably makes it seem a little too easy, maybe, especially on the marketing side. But, uh, you know, the whole everybody can do it and we need tons of small farms. And, yeah, you, you can definitely do it, but the marketing anymore takes up at least half, if not more, of our time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's definitely not just if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd say my local neighbors, I've been really, really, really blessed, uh, the little part of the world we live in. Um, even though we're still the crazy people that raise everything outdoors, yeah, uh, we have a lot of conventional farms around us that, you know, I didn't, I did not grow up as a farm kid. I had never made hay. I had never run heavy equipment, um, did not have any experience. And, you know, a lot of just my local neighbors just let me come and work. You know, if I was mm-hmm. willing to work, they were willing to teach me. And even though we were vastly different in some of our growing practices, you know, running a tractor is running a tractor, making hay is making hay. 
Um, and I, I definitely have a lot of local mentors that just taught me how to run equipment and be efficient. And there's a lot of things that, you know, even though we're going much more down the natural regenerative ag side, there's a lot of things that I've learned from the conventional side as well. Uh huh. Yeah. Some of those farmers are absolutely masters of their craft. I remember one, one of our local farmers in New York, um, I was looking for straw production. I was trying to convince him to grow me some acreage on straw. And he's like, well, why would I do that? I'd be losing my organic matter, my carbon. And he was a conventional dairy farmer. And yep. he was the best farmer in our area because he realized those types of things. Um, and so I just had to say, you know what? I said, that, just that you told me right there, you're not going to do that because you don't want to lose your carbon. I have infinitely more respect for you because you know your soils, you know your farm, you know how to produce a high quality product, even though you use Roundup and GMOs and milk cows on concrete. Yeah, well, and that's what we found as well. You know, a lot of people, we've got really good friends now that have become lifelong friends that are conventional farms, but a lot of them, they were born into it. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, they, their, their hand was already halfway dealt for them before they were even born, and they're just doing the best they can with what they've got. And, you know, it's, I've, I've kind of said it's my biggest blessing and my biggest curse not being born into a farm. You know, I don't uh-huh. have dad and granddad saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. No, you're not going to do it this way. Uh-huh. But at the same time, it'd be awful nice to have a thousand acres and a whole lineup of paid for equipment at the same time too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, especially if you're shifting to or regenerative, which is, can be so much more profitable and can just yep. make the whole system work so much easier. But um, yeah, you're right. I think it is a, a mixed blessing there. So talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, looking back on the five years, if you could have, let's say, just do a magic reset button, what would you have done sooner? I think the biggest thing would have been, you know, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier that I'd always been told you'd never be able to farm, you'd never be able to do this. I guess I wish I would have followed my passion a little bit earlier in life. I mean, granted, I say that starting at 24, 25, but, you know, I would have loved to have taken the opportunity to do a polyface internship or, mm-hmm. you know, learn something under somebody else when I was still young and, you know, not tied down, no responsibilities and, and could have gone and done that for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that would have been indispensable because, uh, you know, we've learned pretty much everything via the school of hard knocks and we've made a lot of mistakes along the road, you mm-hmm. know, reading a couple books and then just trying it. That, and I'd also say just go ahead and spend the money up front and put in the infrastructure you need. It's a lot easier to put in things at the beginning than it is to try to patchwork it together later. Mm-hmm. And it's just going to lead to a lot more frustration when you're trying to fight systems that don't really work with what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the money, spending the money on things definitely is can be painful, uh, but you got to look at the long-term view of things. And, and I'd say I see a lot of producers underutilize some of the resources there are out there when it comes to some of the different government programs. Um, Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people in in this movement are sometimes, you know, anti-government programs, but we've, we could not have gotten where we are without some of the USDA and NRCS small farm programs Mm -hmm. Uh, between equip and the beginning farmer loan that helped us buy this property through FSA, we would not have been able to do it because farm credit and some of the other lenders just laughed at us when we told them what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing we just um, last week's episode, and I forget exactly which week this is going to come out, but um, we're talking about this on October 22nd. Um, We talked to a couple folks from the National Young Farmers Program. And uh, so they also have some great resources around the um, USDA programs that are out there. So I'd highly recommend you check out that episode because we kind of cover a little bit in detail, like the different loan programs and that sort of thing, which are available to new and beginning farmers. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, 
the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed-free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast-track your research to fine-tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. Let's talk a little bit about your labor. So you um, you said you're full-time on the farm. Your wife is, uh, well, probably nights and weekends because she's a, a nurse. Uh, and, yep. oh, she actually works for the, the treasurer's office. She works for the Ohio's treasurer's office. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, and then you have yep. some seasonal help. Yep. And how do you divide roles with all of that? So, and that's definitely been, this was the first year that we really had uh, a lot more labor. Um mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd say that's been a learning experience in and of itself because uh, it's, you know, it's easy when it's just you and you got your own task for a day and, and you're, uh, you know, just going about your day to day. But it's, uh, it's been a whole learning experience for me to manage labor. Um, and it's definitely not, co- not come without some cost uh, mm-hmm. and, and breaking stuff and, uh, you know, definitely learning experiences on both of our parts. But really what we, what we did when we were really in the heart of summer is our, our high school help, um, and we've actually had really, really good success with um, high school girls of all things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we found the young females are really, really passionate about it. They are easier to train. Um, they have better attention to detail, and we have not found one that has quit on us. Um, they wow. are, they've absolutely run, run circles around some of the guys we've had here, honestly. And we really, we kind of divvied it up where we taught them how to do chores. I mean, when, you know, raising that many broilers on top of the other enterprises, chores can almost become all encompassing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got that many birds on pasture and, and this many different kind of irons in the fire. So we really had it where we got it where they could do chores independently, um, knew what to look for when caring for young chicks and, you know, kind of how to do all the different life stages, uh, and we got them so they could work independently on that. Uh, and then we also had a loading crew every night when we were loading out broilers that we'd have, uh, oh, the best nights we'd have five or six different people here oh, wow. helping make it go, go efficiently um, loading out. So that was really our, our biggest divvy was, that, you know, just having them able to do chores freed me up to really focus on some of the bigger things, work on some marketing stuff and work on more of that 30,000 foot level uh workload mm-hmm. and not just spend my time, you know, feeding and watering chickens Absolutely. Uh, and making sure that systems were, were just in place by the time that we could get them doing chores independently was it freed up so much time. It was, it was really uh, pretty disappointing when they had to go back to school in the fall and, and I was back to having to do chores on my own. Yeah. Now with moving like the, the, the mobile range coops, are they uh, just hooking up with like a, a tractor or like a UTV? Uh, we have a, we actually have a, we have a track skid loader. Okay. Um, we, you know, when it's dry enough, uh, we use tractor or, or pickup. Um, but I, you know, about the first half of the growing season this year, when we were still farming in a swamp, it felt like the, the track skid loader was pretty much the, the must have if we were going to move any of those on a daily basis. Gotcha. So let's talk about marketing. Um, you're in the Columbus area, which is in Ohio in the heartland, which a lot of people talk about not being as great of a marketing avenue as let's say being on the coasts. But you said your marketing seems to be going really well, even though you spent a lot of time on it. What are the channels that you're selling through now? So we, when we started, we had really focused and it was kind of just a mindset. You know, we figured that there was only a half a dozen or 10 or so restaurants in the region that would be at a price point and looking for the product that we were raising. Mm-hmm. Uh, so early on, we really focused on getting in front of those guys um, and getting their business kind of with the mindset that we can always grow and it's going to take longer to grow uh, retail sales directly to families. Um, but once those restaurants are really tied up, that's probably not going to be an opportunity that's going to exist again. If, if another farm comes in and really, you know, gets good at that. Gotcha. Um, so early on, you know, we, we kind of went a different route than a lot of people and, and focused on wholesale first. Uh, and now we've got, depending on the season and the time of year, we've got anywhere from six to 12 restaurants that buy from us pretty much every single week. Mm-hmm. Um, and at first we had to really hound those guys, get in front of them, take our, take our product, take our samples, you know, be in there once a week, 
to get their business. And, and now we've, we've got a good enough reputation that, I mean, just this month we've had three chefs reach out to us with restaurants they were opening or, or looking for a new sourcing, wondering if we could supply them now. Mm. Um, so it's kind of been a cool thing to watch the coin flip that first we were begging for business and now we're getting to be a lot more picky about the restaurants we work with um, mm-hmm. and get, you know, pick and choose our, our best customers um but you know instagram has been huge for us on the retail side okay um i don't think there's a better platform when it comes to being able to market your product and tell your story especially mm-hmm. visually we've really grown that uh we've uh, we utilize Gray's cart for our website and our meat sales mm-hmm. um and then we do two farmers markets that we just started doing last year it was our first year doing them this year was our second uh and we've got on farm sales as well um and then starting about eight weeks ago, uh, we actually had enrolled last uh, February. Um, my wife at the time, fiance, had gotten accepted into the very first uh, course that uh, Five Marys out in California put on the small mm-hmm. marketing or small business marketing course for women. Uh, she was able to go out to Fort Jones and, you know, they've been a tremendous resource to us and mentor as far as growing our social media marketing and then now shipping our product, um, Mm -hmm. without, without that course, I don't, there's no way we would be where we are now. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Very cool. So that's been instrumental in you guys being able to scale. Oh, for sure. Uh, especially the, the shipping. Um, and, and like I said, our, our, our social media and, and online presence has, has in just the nine months since we took that course has tripled. Very cool. Let's talk a little about your farmers markets. What do you, um, how do you display product or how do you advertise yourself? Cause I know that's a big problem for meat growers at markets. Cause it's not like vegetables. We can put a pile of carrots out there and people can see those and buy them. Exactly. And we definitely, um, experienced that as well. Uh, it was pretty frustrating at first or, and I'd say the first half of our first year at farmers market was a struggle. And you know, even the first few markets, we wondered, do, do we make a huge mistake uh, mm-hmm. going down the avenue and getting the, the right registrations and everything to be able to do it? But we, we did invest and we built a purpose-built trailer uh, that looks really professional when we take it to market. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we don't just have a freezer in the back of a pickup and a, and a tent. My wife is especially good, you know, on our table. We make it look farmy, but not, you know, cliche, you know. Presence and, and how you present yourself is everything. Uh, we've uh-huh. got a couple of really nice chalkboard signs that we made. Uh, we always try to have fresh cut flowers on the table. And then we, we display, a, we have a chalkboard sign. And we also display a lot of our pricing and specials on butcher paper, um, which we thought was kind of kind of cool to, uh, you know, handwrite it, make it look uh-huh. nice, make it look kind of like an old, old butcher shop. Uh, and we really don't focus at all on, you know, we don't have pictures of living animals. We don't have a photo album. Um, we just focus on the relationships that we've built with customers and just um, presenting ourselves as a very clean, professional, uh, and as organized as possible outfit. And that's really, and then just, you know, taking the time with customers, you, you can always kind of, after a while, you can kind of sense a customer that is just wanting to come up and peruse and a customer that has questions and wants to build a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've definitely found that when we've built relationships, those are the ones that keep on buying, even when farmer's market's over. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm looking through your Facebook here and find a few pictures of your farmer's market stand. So we'll try to push that in the show notes so people can check that out. Now I'm also noticing here, this beautiful picture of your wedding for one of that. So congrats on that guys. Um, uh, but also the on farm, it looked like, uh, event you did. Tell me about that. So, and my wife is, uh, who unfortunately she's working right now and could not be on the podcast with me. Um, she's got a lot of passion for the agritourism side and uh-huh. the marketing. Um, whereas I am, she'll, she'll even tell you that, you know, I, I'm the one that's always the stickler of, Hey, we're a farm first. We're, we're not uh-huh. a farm that just does weddings and happens to have a couple animals. No, we, we raise meat. That's what we do. Uh-huh. Um, and that's what we try to do well. Uh, but you know, she had really wanted an outdoor wedding at our farm. Um, and we had the opportunity, we had some friends that had a greenhouse that they were going to get rid of. Uh-huh. Um, they weren't using and they said, Hey, it's pretty much yours if you move it. 
And gotcha. I thought, cool, now we don't have to, now we don't have to rent a tent. So we'll build <laughs> this greenhouse, which if you're getting married and you're trying to talk yourself into that, just rent the tent. It's, yep. it's a lot easier. <laughs> um, so, but it was kind of one of those things where we had, you know, we had this long-term vision with this property to, with our proximity to Columbus, with our proximity to, to these great chefs, um, we had wanted to eventually have some on-farm dinners uh-huh. and be able to do stuff. Uh, and, you know, when the opportunity to, to really cut your teeth and host your wedding for your first on-farm event presents itself, you take it. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So we, we built this greenhouse. Uh, we have a chef who's the, the sous chef at the number two restaurant in town, volunteered his time to come out and do a hall gross for it. Oh, very cool. Uh, and we built a pit, you know, in traditional cinder block with just – iron rods uh across it is how we built our hog pit um and kind of took a a book out of the traditional southern style hog pit we did that we we did a wedding we we did it on a budget of about five thousand dollars for everything um which is kind of crazy yeah um and now we have a venue that you know we've got a greenhouse that she can use it for plants and flowers and she's she's wants to start doing some more cut flower stuff uh-huh. Uh, and, and she she really likes that. It's kind of her niche on the farm. Um, so we have a multi-purpose where in the spring and early summer she has a greenhouse that she can do starts in. Uh, but it, you know the rest of the time of year we can clear that out and and have an event space as well. Uh-huh. Uh, you know do quarterly supper clubs and and again it kind of all comes full circle to how can we build relationships and how can we create something where we're not only are we building a customer who's going to buy product from us, but we're also able to teach the consumer, you know, where your food's coming from, why, why we do things the way we do and, and try to get them to have a relationship with their food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now that's a great, great idea. And I love that aspect that you, yes, you are a farm, but you are going to add that aspect because here's the thing. I feel that we, Yes, we would love to think that the small-scale farm is going to take over agriculture. I don't think that's ever going to happen in the U.S. especially. But what we can do is we can, as small-scale farms, educate people about why small farms matter. And that's why we need the agritourism. We need the people on the farms to educate them about where their food comes from. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, most people nowadays, we, we definitely see it that most people don't have a really, you know, most people have no idea where milk comes from. Most people uh-huh. just see meat as a styro, you know, something that's in styrofoam and cryo at the grocery store. They don't, you know, there's a total non, uh, you know, disconnect. Uh, what's the right word? disconnect with uh, that product being a living animal and that uh-huh. being a muscle from a living animal. Um, and, you know, we and we are going to be doing an event at the beginning of November where we're, we're going to hopefully start doing more of them in the future, but we call it movie, uh, Dinner and a Movie Night. Uh-huh. And, you know, we're going to show the first time we're going to show the documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. Uh-huh. Um, and then we hopefully will show more kind of agricultural and environmental docu, you know, documentary style movies in the future. Uh-huh. And we're going to get some of our friends and other producers at the farmer's market and just have people from, and honestly, we're going to have people from both sides of the aisle too, both conventional and regenerative, just to tell people, hey, this is why we do what we do. And, uh-huh. you know, we as regenerative farmers, like I said, we've tried to just build a community where, you know, yeah, we're the people raising everything on pasture and outdoors, but I need my grain farmer right next door who's my neighbor because that's where our corn and comes from for our animal feed you know we're not good at raising grain we're just good at raising animals but our our pigs and our chicken need non-gmo grain Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely yeah so let's move a little bit to um your advice to new farmers so you've been farming for five years now what do you see the biggest mistake that the beginning farmers that are just starting out making uh probably the biggest thing is don't sell yourself short just for sale Mm. um you know, it, it drives us a little bit crazy at markets or, you know, seeing other farms in the region advertising online or whatnot when, you know, we're we're at a pretty large scale now for pastured broilers. And, you know, we have it down to about the penny of what it cost us to produce one. Uh-huh. And when we see a farm that's only raising a few hundred or maybe a thousand a year that's under our price of production, you know, we know they're not making money. And uh-huh. I'd say don't don't do it just to get a sale or just to make yourself feel good. 
Um, yeah. cause really you're, you're kind of hurting everybody at the end of the day. Cause then consumers will say, well, I can go and get a dozen of eggs for my neighbor for a dollar 50. Okay. Well, I can't even produce a dozen eggs for a dollar 50 yep. by the time that you're honest with yourself between the carton and refrigeration and raising that hen for six months and feed and, you know, everything that goes into that, there's, there's no way. Mm-hmm. So I'd say that that's probably my biggest piece of advice is just be honest with yourself, be honest with your numbers and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, it, we'd love to see tons of small farms, but we, we want to see in our minds at the end of the day, sustainable is, is being here for more than a year or two. It's, mm-hmm. you know, paying the bills and being here long term because if you're not financially sustainable, none of the, none of the rest matters. Absolutely. And it takes a few years to get there, but don't just start dumping product in the beginning just to get people in front of your because if you do that, you're just going to get attract those bargain hunters. Exactly. I mean, and, and we, you know, we, we really, we, when we first started going to farmer's markets, we priced our products, what we felt was on the high end of the scale, just because we mm-hmm. felt we could always come down, but you don't have a whole lot of upward elasticity. Yeah. Um, and then we just stuck to our guns and, and knew that this is really what it costs us and what we need to make if this farm is going to be viable long term. So we just stuck to our guns and it, it was painful for especially the first half of that first season of doing markets. But now people don't even blink. And we had cust- we have customers that are buying hundreds of, hundreds of dollars of product a month from us. Oh, wow. Uh, but it's taken, you know, it's taken five years to get to that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was, you know, there was definitely a lot of years that were, you know, we'd be sitting on product and we'd be wanting to just, you know, discount our stuff to sell it and move it. So we'd feel like we were doing something, but, I don't regret sticking to our guns now because now we have customers that are incredibly loyal, believe in what we're doing, both chefs and retail customers. And, and I'm really glad that we stuck to our guns that in that regard. Mm, Absolutely. All right. So let, but let's be clear on this is you weren't planning on the farm, giving you a salary for the first couple of years, correct? No, no. I, and I'll be completely honest. You know, I had an all farm job. Mm -hmm. Um, I had made some really, I, I did commercial fishing and wildland firefighting in college and was able to save a bunch of money early in my mm-hmm. life and was pretty smart with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that allowed us to, you know, build it the way that we needed to. And, you know, we were probably in that exact same boat where the first couple of years, you know, while I still had a full-time off-farm job, it was a hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, it, was a, it was a very big hobby, but it was a hobby. Um, but... It, it was a farm because you were making sure that you were making it pay for itself in the aspect that you knew what you're investing, you knew what the cost of production were, you knew what you're uh, you know, acquiring new customers. So you were on an upward scale. It wasn't just the, I'm just going to have a couple of pigs in the backyard. Exactly. I mean, it, it long term, you know, I still had a, my family included telling me, oh, we'd never be able to do this. We'd never be able to do this. But I, you know, you could kind of you can look at the numbers, you can look at the scale, you can look at the demand and see that, hey, if we really busted our butts, this can really become something. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, exactly, we treated it like a business from day one. You know, we, we filed business permits and a Schedule F and IRS tax ID, everything from day one. Mm-hmm. Um, and we treated it like a business from day one. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said that we made money from the word go, Yeah. but we've built equity every single year. Well, yeah, and I don't think anyone made money from the get-go, um, <laughs> even though they like to, they like five, to think about years, it. Five years, in, I'm not, five years in, I'm not sure we make money yet, but <laughs> the balance, balance sheet keeps growing. I'm not sure the bank account does, but at least our, our banker says we're making money. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's the important part because I see so many people, they, let's say, invest in some equipment and some feed and some animals, and then at the end of the first year, they say, well, I actually have no money in my account, but what they don't realize is that equity grew. And that's oh, what, exactly. And that's all that counts is if you're trending in the right direction, you may not have any cash right now, but if you're, you're growing that equity and growing that investment in your business, at the end of the day, you can say, yes, this is a profitable business because so many businesses aren't profitable from day one. They got to take that incubation period and you got to be able to make those mistakes and start to build that brand and who your customers are. Yep. And we've, you know, we've definitely between, like I said, we did the five marriages course and that was, that was not an inexpensive investment, but we no. We've continuously invested back in our farm and especially in both on the production side and the marketing side. Mm -hmm. And honestly, every time we've made that investment in ourselves, especially, I mean, the five Mary's course, I'd be lying if I did not say that was a stretch for us. Um, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the education that we received and, you know, the, the learning curve that that shortened was worth every single penny. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and every time that we've invested in ourselves, it's hurt at the moment, but it's come back to us tenfold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, let's start wrapping this up here because I know you've got, you're a farmer, you got things to do. <laughs> um, if you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? One would be tough. Uh, I'd probably have to say, well, there's two with one being my favorite. We got a hog cart uh, last year that has been absolutely indispensable for moving pastured livestock. But probably my number one would be uh, we upgraded to a Gallagher fence charger um, mm-hmm. two years ago. And I we have the, it's so simple, but the little mobile remote fence tester that both is a fault finder and you can turn the fence on and off at any point in the property. Oh, wow. And to not get hit with a 19 joule charger because mm-hmm. you know that it's off and you can turn it off at any point in the farm is mm-hmm. indispensable and saves so many steps. Okay. Yeah. I, that's uh, that I'm going to definitely include that in the show notes. Cause that's, um, that's awesome. Um, and what's your favorite fencing company to purchase from? We use a lot of Gallagher supplies. Again, mm-hmm. they're, they're not the cheapest, um, but they are worth their weight in gold. Uh, as far as electric fencing supplies go, um, they mm-hmm. hold up really well. Uh, and honestly, our fencing, um, we paid a contractor to put in almost all of our fencing, and that was worth every single penny because in two weeks, they got done a better job than I ever could have done in an entire year. Um, and that's one thing, you know, that we've we've kind of learned both the hard way and just in time is if there's somebody that's a lot better at you that, to do something and you can afford to do it, pay them to do it. You know, mm-hmm. we've we've definitely gone down the route of us trying to do a lot of things ourselves and building a lot of infrastructure ourselves. Uh, but like fencing, that was one thing that having somebody that does it every single day and has the, you know, he had a hydraulic post pounder on a skid loader and he had, you know, good fence stretching equipment, and knew how to do everything right, where he made a fence way better than I ever could have. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd say Gallagher for electric. We use a lot of Premier One products as well. Um kind of have a love hate relationship with poultry netting and hog mm-hmm. netting. Uh, we really like it and it works really, really well when it works, but it's also great at faulting out and causing sometimes more heartache than it's worth. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we do use a lot of the premier one stuff uh, and the Gallagher products. Very cool. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, so best thing, um, like I said earlier, we're really active on Instagram. It's just Cubby Rice Farms Ohio on Instagram. Uh, we have a website that seems like it's constantly under upgrading and improving uh, as we improve that. And that's just, again, Cubby Rice Farms, uh, dot com, or I'm sorry, Cubby Rice Farms Ohio dot com. Uh, and then we're on Facebook as well. Um, and we're, you know, we've been really open about this, this kind of whole journey. Uh, Please, if you've got questions on how we've done things, what we've, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, please ask away because we're, we're always open to, to trying to help other people get started in it. Well, I really appreciate your time, Charlie, um, spending the time here telling us about your journey. And it's fascinating because um, it's just so cool to see how fast you've grown and, uh, and, and really focusing on making this a business. Um, because that's the key part. If you're ever going to go long in this, you have to make this a business. So appreciate that. And uh, yeah, would love to have you on you and again in a couple of years and see how your farm keeps growing. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. We appreciate the opportunity. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Yep, you as well. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.